Hey everyone, I'm Reese, and today we're going to build out a name service application using the Cosmos SDK stack and then expanding that into IVC to build out an IVC module that allows for cross-chain collaboration with your module application. I'm a protocol engineer at Roll Chains. We, were, we built out the Spawn protocol, and this allows you to quickly build Cosmos SDK applications that bring your applications to the interchain stack. Yeah, so I'm very glad to be with you here today, Reese. So I am Oli. I'm the DevRel lead for the Interchain Foundation, so stewarding everything around the Interchain stack. Uh, and yeah, today I know you're going to be showing me some cool stuff with Spawn. So I think let's just get into it. Let's dive right in. So the first thing, we need to actually set up our environment if you're not casually a developer. So if you want to head to the Installations tab within our documentation, and there's a system set up. So for you using macOS, you can go down to the macOS section. And here are the, the basics that you need to have installed. A lot of developers will already have these installed, but anything that you don't already have, you can copy paste over into your terminal. Yeah, so I think I have most of these installed already. Uh, it all went swimmingly, so I think I am through that step, awesome. but others might not be. Yeah, let's head over into installing Spawn then. So the first thing you need to do is to get clone the repository. This is gonna grab the latest version for us. And then you're going to move into that directory and then make install. And this is going to take that, that spawn source code and build it into a binary so you can execute it and build on the interchain stack. The next command there is going to get local interchain. This is going to install our testnet tool that will allow you to run the interchain stack locally and have a testnet based environment to verify that all of the code that we're about to write does indeed work. And you can test it as if it was almost in production. So now you can uh, run that, that make get local IC. This installs the testnet runner. So now that we've installed both of these, let's verify that the installations were successful. So if you run the spawn command, we can see that that command line interface comes up ideally. It does, and let's verify also for local interchain. Amazing. If for some reason it shows that you get a command not found in the documentation as seen here, you're able to copy paste these into your terminal and get it to work. Now that we have nice. spawn and local interchain installed, let's actually go build our first application. So if you wanna to head to the your first app application section, this walks through an overview of what we're going to do here, building a proof of stake network. We're going to then build a custom module. This module will be our application. And the application is going to allow for us to set a custom name to our wallet that we own. And then we'll build on top of this to allow us to set it from another network. So if you want to head to the first command, the spawn new role chain, this is going to build up the base consensus of all of the formatting that we need and the structure. You press enter here, and Spawn will begin to build up this world chain using proof of stake. If you don't provide consensus and the disable flags, a pretty UI will pop up for you to select which features of the stack you want. Some that are not already provided here by default, but this allows you to just get working with this tutorial here. The new chain has been generated. We can now move into that directory. What did we call it? We called it world chain. chain. And then from here, we're actually going to scaffold our new name service module using the spawn module new name service command. Name service, in this case, could be any other name that you decide to choose, but for this tutorial, we'll use name service. And just like that, your module's already been created, and we haven't even had to write any code yet. So if you want to scroll down in the documentation, we can now move over to setting the structure. With this, we're going to start modifying files, so it may be important to open this up within your code editor so we can see the structure of the application. Code dot. There we go. And perfect. So we need to open tx.proto. So just control P and oh, no, it should just open yeah. us up here. And so Ooh. here's a proto file. Think of this as the base data structure for what our application is going to interact with. This just gives us a format that we can begin to plug into and have it auto generate code for us. So within here, below the update params on the left side of your screen, you can place in the, the new code there. Below the last update params? So if you actually want to check, there's a details on the documentation. You can open that up to see what does it look like. 
that may be quite small, but we post it right <laughs> below where update params is, and then you can paste all of that in. So from here on lines 42 to 44, you're going to copy paste those up to currently line, line 19. Within the brackets or after? Actually the... delete that bracket and then paste it. We have the bracket there. There we go. So now the base message service has been created. We have the update params. We have our new set service name. And what this allows us to do at the very bottom on line 50, a sender who will be us is going to be set. And then there's a string which will be allowed for us to set a name. And this can be any arbitrary value that we decide. And then the response is just empty as we don't really need a response for this. We're going to do the same, but now for the query. So if you want to open up the query file, we're going to do this pretty much the same format where the resolve name RPC will be set in the service. And then we have those two requests as well. Queries. So we're, oh, we're just adding these, yep. these functions at the end. Yep. And then if you want to pull from lines 26 to 30, that will get moved up to the service area into the service after here. Yep, paste there. And then delete that last, exactly. I'm going to request a wallet using the resolve name request. And in response, it will give me a name because I'm asking for some data. We can now generate these into the Go code equivalents. And this is shown on the documentation using the make protogen. You run this command in the terminal and it will bundle everything together using Docker into the Go code. The reason that we do protobuf is to allow for other languages to also interact. And your Docker daemon is not running. My Docker daemon is not. So we'll need to resolve that running Docker, which is also shown in the system setup. And now we need to run that to ensure that we can interact with Docker to run and download that binary to compile all of our code. Great. Okay. Now try to run that command again and it should work. There we go. Yeah. So. The Docker instance now, it's taken all of our proto code and it's actually automatically put that code into our application for us and connected it. You don't have to know how to, it just does it for you by finding other references in your app and putting that in. So it's generated Go code off of our proto it is, syntax. Yes, Go code has been generated off of the proto and plugged into the SDK application for you. That's beautiful. Can you run me just slightly through modules of the SDK for yeah. the sake of our audience. As so well. a module can be thought through as an extension where the SDK gives you a base to start off of, but to build your custom logic, you need extensions or modules as they're called in our ecosystem. From here, you can build custom business logic that surfaces your users or your specific use case. So for us, we're building the name service. Others may be DeFi protocols or transferring some data between users or having your own application. And it depends on what you really want, but we call those at a generalized module. Okay, so that gives us the power to effectively natively imp implement the business logic where many other sort of monolithic chains, you sort of deploy smart contracts on top of other it, existing systems. Here. Exactly. And the thing that's great about Cosmos is you could also deploy applications through our service called Cosmwasm, which allows for you to deploy smart contracts on top of writing modules and then having those two connect seamlessly as well. So this is all possible for this demo. We just show the basics of modules. Future demos will also showcase how to use smart contracts and how to interact together with modules or with the smart contract directly as a user. Great. So it's the best of both worlds. You can get native performance for your business logic, or you can enable Cosmosm and deploy on top with additional contract dynamic on-chain code. Exactly. Yep. Cosmos is great. Beautiful. <laughs> if you want to head back into the documentation, we can now move to writing our actual application logic because we have the structure set up. So the first thing we need to do is head over to this thing called a keeper. In the SDK, if you're coming from a, a developer background, this is pretty much a singleton class, if you want to think of it like other languages. This is where we're going to store the base of our logic and the SDK can then read from it. We have some other things. You don't need to know what a lot of this does. We just need to set this new name mapping. So if you want to copy the name mapping line, which is a map of a string, which will be the user's wallet or the user's unique ID, and we're gonna map that over to the name. So we're gonna paste that into the keeper structure. We just need the line that is highlighted, which is below the three dots. There we go. And then paste that over somewhere with like under the ORMDB or anywhere here is really fine. That base structure of a map is set, which means that as we run the application, this will be saved to the disk. 
And that way, as your network starts up again, it can actually read from that. While we have that structure, we do need to set it with the new map that just gives us a base default that we can begin saving data to, so we have some way to interact with it. So you're gonna paste this in the new keeper. If you scroll down some, you can add this somewhere uh, below line 60, but above line 68. So if you wanna paste it at the bottom and then save the file. And what this does is it's a template for creating that, that collections map. So we have the map, we're able to save it to disk, but now we need to be able to interact with it with code. And that's what this allows for us to do is to actually interact with it on the code side. Can you give me a quick rundown of the Keeper uh, and its sort of memory versus like state on the chain itself? The way that the SDK works is we have the memory, we're going to then save it to disk every once in a while, and it will allow for us to interact with it in memory, but also save it to disk where if the network goes down for some reason, or you shut down your validator, everything is still continued to be saved. So you don't have to deal with the saving to disk, the SDK automatically handles that for you. And now we get to write the actual application logic. So if you head over into the message server, which is the SDK's way of a message is similar to an action. I want to perform an action. It's going to go to this action server, formerly known as the message server. Within here, we have this base template on lines 33 to 35, which give you a base of where to put this code. And now we can put in this, this custom logic here. And then paste that and then delete those, those trailing lines. What this is doing is it's grabbing the message server, which is just an object. It has the keeper inside of it, so that way we have reference or we can access a keeper that previously we wouldn't have access to. We're then going to call the name mapping, which is that instance we just set that, that saves to state. We're going to set the message.sender, which we specified in the protobuf file. If you want to actually control click on that, you should be able to see that where that message resides in the go code that we custom generated with using the make protogen command. And there's also the name field, which is where we're going to set the text that we want for our name. And we set that there as the, the value to what the sender is. We check if there's an error, return an error. There shouldn't be for most cases, unless something has gone wrong on your other code side. For example, if you forgot to set up the keeper properly, an error here will say, hey, you didn't set up that collection. And then we return an empty type because we don't need a response. The SDK will tell us that the message was successful. We now have the logic for actually setting a name mapping. Let's now allow us to grab a name from a given address. So we'll head over to the query server, which allows for any user to query some data from the chain. And we're going to paste in that logic there within the resolve name function that was generated for us. Here, we grab that same name mapping. It's very similar to how the message server works. The only difference is we return a value in that response to the user based off of their request. We're just reading directly from that name mapping, and then we're resolving that name based off of that value, which is what V stands for. If there's an error, it will return an error. If not, the user will get the request. Perfect. Now we're gonna go configure the client because we need a way to interact with it from that binary that we that we built, which was going to package everything that we've done into a single application. There's a lot here. It's very scary looking, but at a high level, it abstracts away a lot of setup. In a future demo, it will showcase how to do this manually if you don't want this abstracted version. For this, we're gonna to head to what the SDK calls the auto CLI. This is an automatically generated command line interface for your application. And we're just going to paste in a new resolve name. So the RPC method resolve name is a query, which we specified in the proto buff. We called it resolve name within the message service. And then we add some use cases, how to use it, what are the fields that are allowed into this, and what's a short e explainer of this. The ordering does um, not matter here. And I'm just adding it alongside the params that I have. Exactly. Hear so by default, already. we give params to all that way that you have a template for where you want to begin building up future logic. With this, we're going to add on top of that. So now we have both params and resolve name queries for our application. The next thing is how do we actually set that? Well, we need to just go into the set or the transaction command, and we're going to set the name service using a very similar format as the query. It's just going to be used for creating this transaction where again, a transaction is a list of actions. We've got the set name service. We have the query now. We can move into the next step, which is actually running this testnet. 
we give you in Spawn a very easy way to run this testnet. It abstracts away a lot of setup. At a high level, it is going to run the SDK chain, it is going to compile it, it is going to start a single validator and give you base, temp base defaults for your parameters. So if you want to open up a terminal and run that command within this directory now, it'll begin to start and build up this testnet. This is going to go mod tidy, which just sets up your Go environment to have the latest and greatest. It then also does this for a test environment for with an interchain test, which is full end-to-end -end integration. So out of the box, not only do you get the Cosmos SDK application, but you also get a full tested environment with all of the modules that you specified. For this, we have some defaults that, that were given. We disabled Cosmwasm. If you were to enable Cosmwasm, you would get testing right there in GitHub CI automatically connected for you. There was a lot that just happened on the screen. That was just all of the base setup. This can be found in the scripts folder and you can find that within the role chains directory we just generated. And now we have a running blockchain application that used all of the parameters that we set and blocks are happening. So if you wanna scroll down now on the documentation side, we can begin to interact with this testnet. There's this roll D command, which was what we just built up using make sh testnet. There's a transaction subcommand that the SDK gives you, and we're going to interact with the name service. With this, we are going to set our name. This can be your name, or by default, it is given Alice. And the make sh testnet also sets up an SDK account for you, which allows you some funds to interact with the chain. Uh, finally, at the end, the dash dash yes just allows us to skip the prompting for do you actually want to submit this transaction. So if you want to run that now in another tab, it will automatically hit the testnet, execute that code, and we will return a transaction hash or a unique ID for us to verify did our transaction indeed work. And then pasting this in, press enter, and it's going to return this transaction hash. This is always unique per transaction. And now we're going to query this to ensure did it really set. So you'll use the query transaction command, which is found right below. And you query that, and there's a lot of data here, but at a high level, you're looking for anything that just says error. So if you scroll up through the message, there's no error logs, it looks like. So our transaction did indeed go through from our account. Now let's verify that we can actually go find that on the chain using the resolve command that we just set in the auto CLI. There's two commands here. The first one, we know what the address is because we could find that within the, the transaction itself. The other option, it will pull it from your key ring, which is just where accounts are stored by default. So if we query this, we get the name Alice, which is what we set. And if you run the other command, it just is a prettier way. If you don't know what the address is off of hand, it's the same case where it's going to just fill out what that is using the keys show command, which is the account one, which is where we set that from whenever we sent that transaction. With this, we actually have an entire application that we built off of building the Cosmos SDK and we're setting it on a single chain. If you go to the next section, there is a bonus where others that want to learn more of, of challenging themselves, there are hints and solutions for limiting input as well as resolving a wallet from a name. We only did it one way. How do we also do it that other way? And you can walk through that there and see those different solutions. This is awesome. Thank you so much, Reese. Yes. Now it's time to extend this with IBC. So we're doing this on a single chain. We'll call this chain A. But what if I want to actually set my name from a different chain that has a connection? So I'm on chain A, but I want to utilize it from chain B. And this allows for interoperable applications across different stacks where chain A can focus on a name service while chain B focuses on something else. But through that, we can send packets to actually interact with both protocols through each other. So this is great from a, you focus on what is important to you for your app, and then others can also interact with that and utilize it in their own code. So we'll head over into the applications demo section and head over to the IBC name service module. This has a prerequisite of this previous tutorial we just did, but we're gonna build on top of this, building a new module and interacting with that previous logic. With this though, we do need to stop that other testnet. So if you head over to the make command on your left, or you can just kill all with the roll D, that will just kill that testnet so we can begin building up a future testnet using IBC. We're in the role chain directory. We're gonna build a new module. This is gonna be called name service IBC. And we pass the IBC module flag to provide that module logic that is different from the base module, we need the IBC specific logic. And your module's generated, 
And with this, we're going to now run make protogen just to get the latest to be sure that all of our namespaces match what we expect. It's going to move anything over that needs to. For this, we haven't modified anything yet, so we have an, a base IVC module. Now we need to go set up the custom logic to actually interact with what we've just built. We want to head over to the name service IVC Keeper. We need to allow it access to the other module that we just created. So we created the name service Keeper, and we need now to be able to grab that. So we're going to import that from within our local directory using that, that import command there. Where's the neatest place to put this? Uh, normally, you just put it at the top. At the top. And that name service, it will show red until we actually reference it, which we're going to do in the keeper. So the next line is going to be inside the keeper, that way that we have reference to that. So you can add this anywhere. And now we're pulling reference to that keeper. If you want to actually control click on the dot keeper on that name service line that we just placed, you can hover over that and see that is what we just wrote previously. So we have access to it. It all works. Heading back to the Keeper, we're going to actually allow the application a way to reference and give access to it. So in the on the new Keeper line, we're going to passing an argument where we'll put that, that name service Keeper. And then we need to allow access and actually set it up to the Keeper using the name service Keeper there within the Keeper initialization. If you save on this file, the application is now going to not be happy, so we need to head over to the app to go set it up. We're going to head over to the app.go file. There's a little red tick on the side scroll bar of your VS Code. Mm. It's saying, hey, we don't have enough arguments here because we need to add that line. And with that, that that's actually going to go at the top for you since you, you imported it mm. at the top of your new keeper. And if there's no red lines, it means that it's happy. What this does is it, the application as it's setting up is going to say, here you go, you can have this, and then we can begin to use its logic in there. So we're all set up from the application side. We have all of the base logic. It's now time to actually set our name on this IVC packet. We're going to head over to the IVC module.go, which is where all of the IVC cross-chain compatible logic is set up. This has a lot of configuration you can do. By default, it will just work out of the box. We're going to go find the handle on receive logic method. This is the method where you're going to put any logic that you want for after a packet has successfully been sent and is verified and confirmed it's from a valid user. We're going to then go and do some logic. By default, we have this example store. For this, we don't need that. We're going to copy paste over from the documentation to set a name on that name service keeper for the name mapping. So you can copy paste those lines. There's also some extra verification here just to ensure that a name isn't too long, which is found in one of the bonus tutorials. The logic is now set up here. We can now build up the application, build it into a new test net, which is going to use local interchain, and this is going to start multiple instances. This may take a minute, so if you want to open up a tab and then run the make install and make local image commands. Make install will build the base binary. This is the role D. You could also run make sh testnet. It runs the make install under the hood. Run make local image. This is going to build up that same binary, but in a Docker image that you can then share with others or run for multiple testnet compliance. We'll use local interchain to start a self IBC testnet. This is automatically created for you. If you want to find the source, you can find that in the chains directory within the role chain that we just created. And there's a JSON file where you can go configure it, run more validators, run other configurations, change the parameters, or change other aspects of how we connect this together. We're launching chain A, which is role chain. We're launching chain B, which is also role chain. And then we're going to connect those using a relayer, which is what IBC uses. That relayer will pass the messages from chain A to chain B seamlessly without the user having to know what is going on. And we do all of that through Docker so you as the developer can focus on what is important to you, your application. And this is also where the interchain gets exciting and where it becomes the internet of blockchains. Exactly. So this is the core of what the interchain's focus is. How do we allow for everyone to interoperate together? And with this, we can. We actually have the image now. So let's start the testnet, run local IC, start self IBC. If you don't know what chains are already given to you, you can run local IC chains, and that will showcase all of the chains that are in your directory. I will do that. Local IC chains. 
Exactly. And there's what we have. There's a README that you can go read about. There's self IBC and testnet. Another fun thing is that you can actually upload that to GitHub and then reference the URL and start from a URL. So you can share it between other members as well that are on your team and just have a testnet there that works out of the box with a local interchain. Also, local interchain is Dockerized. So if you don't want to install the direct binary, you can run it through Docker. With this, it's going to go through that configuration and begin to set up chains. There's a lot of stuff happening. You as the developer don't need to know. It's just in the setup and you can learn about this later. We're starting at chain A, we're starting chain B, then we're gonna set up a relayer between these. If you want to now open up a new tab and we can get ready for the next step, which is actually running our first IBC transaction, there's this section called import test helpers. By default, we give a bash instance or a shell where you can interact with local interchain very, very simply. You just import this into a file, which is what that curl command does. That will save it to a file called source.bash. And I curl this straight into Yeah, you just paste that right in. And if you actually want to view that file, you can, or you can just source it directly. So it is, it is source available. Everything is there for you. And this just adds interchain test commands. That way that I can execute against it. I can interact with the relayer. I can do things with IBC that I typically can't do without running all of this convoluted code. We as the users don't need to know that. I just want to interact. And so this gives a lot of helpful commands to do that. With that, we source it, which is going to take all of that code and run it in our terminal and now gives us access to those functions. Local Interchain gives an API for you to interact with, to run transactions, to run other things that are not on your machine. And so this gives us access to that via that API. If you want to now head back over to the role chains testnet that is being started up, we can verify that that has started and we can see that. If you want to open that up, you can see the base API. We have documentation on this. There's info, there's chain registry, there's other things that you can do. You can upload contracts through this and just a lot of helpful methods to see. Our test set is up. The relayer is running behind the scenes. If you go back to another tab, you can run Docker PS and we can see that that is the case. Docker PS is, is to show all processes. We've got a relayer, it's running latest. It started about a minute ago. We have role chain that has started two minutes ago and another one as well. This automatically maps to your host ports. So you can actually go view this in your browser using the, the values there. Chain zero will give you the defaults for what the SDK is usually giving. The other ones will be randomized based off of free ports on your machine. Let's actually go connect our IBC module now that we've, we've generated. So there's a I, ICT relayer exec. This is going to execute a command on the relayer. It's found in that source that we bashed. It's going to run this on local chain one, which is set in the, the configuration. And if you want to paste that in and press run, cool. this is going to use the connect command in the relayer between chain one and chain two. This was automatically set up whenever we created the chain. You can find this in the logs. And we use a source port. We're going to specify the NS IVC module we created. Then on the other side, because we're running the same chain twice, the destination is also the name service IBC. Order unordered just means that I as a user can post any amount of transactions. They'll come over. It doesn't matter what order they happen in. We're just going to send that. And then we specify the version, which is the NS IBC module. And we just prefix that with that with a one. After you run that, a lot of logs will come down. You may see some things that say error account sequence mismatch. If you do see that, it's fine. The relayer will realize it and will automatically do it for you. Now let's verify. Did the channel actually create? Do we have a connection between both chains? We can then run that echo command to verify that it is the case. We see state open, unordered, counterparty, NSIBC. And then there's also another state open at the bottom for the, the last three lines, which is a default transfer port that allows you to transfer tokens. That's not part of this demo, but there is the IBC transfer demo, which will utilize this. We've created a module. We have the relayer. The relayer is now connected together because we've told it, please use my, my module. And now we're ready to execute our transaction across this. We're going to use the transaction command that is given by default with the name service IBC module. It's just called example transaction. And that will allow us to execute against channel one, which we saw in the query just above. We have channel ID one, and we're going to send it from an account, in this case, account zero, on local chain one. So we're sending this from chain A, and we're specifying yes, and we want the name to be test name. 
and the packet is then generated and we can query that using the roll D query transaction command. This may be different from what you see by the logs because it is using IBC under the hood. There's different setups and things that can change that. We can scroll through this and see all of the logs that have, that have occurred with IBC, but the most important part is this packet data where we have the center and some data which is test name uh, above the hex. And so this is what we're sending and some data is going to be our name in this case. For the example transaction, we just sent it as some data, but the other side will be able to understand that and know where to pull it from. Let's go verify on chain two from local chain two that we can query the name service module to resolve the name that we sent from chain A. So you paste this into the terminal. We resolve the name for that other on chain two, and it does indeed verify because the IBC packet has sent. You can also check the relayer logs by running Docker PS. If you copy the port ID on that top one, the 9962, you can copy that. And then run docker logs dash F and then paste in that ID. And if you scroll up past the, the queries and you continue to go up, there'll be a lot of text that specifies things are transferring here. So we can see path names. You can see all of the logs for what is actually happening with that packet behind the scenes that is being done for the user and for you as the developer. And it just works. You're able to go verify if something didn't go right here, look and see, is there a special reason why? If not, you can view all of this here. You can also see it in the test net itself that is, as it's running, it'll show you the commands that the relayer is running and those transactions. We've run a relayer. We have multiple net networks. We've connected them over IBC and we modified a value on a chain that we are not on, but we're pushing from the other chain. IBC Go has now worked. We've built our custom module and we have an application that is now cross-chain usable. So very, very exciting stuff. Yeah, this is absolutely awesome. And it's awesome to see it with a tool that you have uh, led the development on with Spawn. Uh, so yeah, thanks for also showing me something new. And yeah, getting this going has been pretty cool to see. This is genuinely my first time running through this this tutorial and it it's, really pretty, pretty straightforward. Well, I'm super excited <laughs> to hear that. And the best part is, is that this makes building on IBC even easier than it ever has been. So we're excited to be bringing IBC module support to Spawn and running test nets and being able to really improve the developer experience for building cross-chain applications compared to the, the previous status quo. So really, really excited to hear and uh, excited to see what others want to build on top of this using the Cosmos SDK stack and IBC modules. Lovely stuff. So for those of you who are watching this from Cosmos India, we're really keen to see what you build with this tool. And we'd love to see some of you come over to Cosmoverse and Hackmos, uh, particularly to participate in that hackathon as part of Hackmos. There's some super nice prizes up for grabs and the interchain stack track will be run by us and both Reese and myself will be there to also help you along your journey as you get building with some of these tools and creating your own chains and roll-ups and IBC applications and smart contracts and anything possible with the interchain stack. So we're really keen to see you there. Thanks everyone. Thanks.